Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen. Guten Morgen, Nechibor. Guten Morgen. Nach du Audun from Snottingahame. Ja, das ist ja. Harald fra Derabiu. Ernir E. Das bin ich. Du möchtest du nicht, ja. Ist das dein Lucky? Hannes. Ich so hört. Und ich misste Hans. Und so ein Stei sag ich fauer ran. Ich dann und hinkauf. Das öskere ich mir. Du sollst du ei i dag. Ne, heu dei sag ich bu dan i dan. Hvar sot du, Hanna? Und sem stede bi sem forde. Hannes vel alti jorwik. Eh, herst det nu und sere spitje tes fraun. Dat is orla. Jag sikker fram. Eh, det grate bara som full opp i sere brygge. Baras. Berar. Hvat er berar? Grat. Brisli der. Jovras? Jovrar. Ja, du säger satt. Goda weather i dag. Grane? Ja, und det. Och god weather. God weather. Och tryggvar. Orvar. Let me let me just take one second to compliment both of us on how perfectly historically authentic our costumes were. Down to the last stitch. We we discussed this briefly. <laughs> um, and I think we both I mean you 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 said first, but I think we both thought that um modern modern outfits were less distracting. Um and I I think you said material culture and things like that start to make it more People will focus on, on on that and not so much on the language. Whereas, yeah. this happens to me all the time because, like, uh, you know, a real recent example is Assassin's Creed Valhalla, where I consulted on language and names and runes and stuff. You know, I don't consult on the costumes or the weapons or anything like that. But yeah. people say this isn't historically yeah. accurate because this this axe wouldn't have been used in this decade. It's like that's that's not what I did. Just, it, but but that, but that's what people obsess about is material culture. Yeah. So I'm like, no, I'm taking all that stuff away from you. All you get in this video is language. Okay, so I just pulled up this question from Anar Christensen, a, a supporter who couldn't be here, and uh, he he mentions an Egil saga. Of course, you have Egil Skallagrimson and his brother Thorolver joining the army of King Adelstan, uh, the Battle of Brunnenberg, often dated to about 937. And Egil composes poetry in the court of the English king. And his representative is just talking to the king without any mention of translators or anything like that. How how realistic is this scenario? I think I watched one of your videos where you mentioned that there's a situation where it explains that um, the person was able to compile poetry for an English king because, um, uh, because their languages were the same at that point or something like that. I'm, I might have got that well off. Um, there's there's two old Norse texts that say something very like that. So in, in the saga of Gunlaug Wormtongue, um, it says that he goes and he serves for a while in the court of the English king. And there's a very explicit note. And the saga is written in the late 1200s. But it says, at that time, which would be around 1000, at that time, the language in England and Scandinavia was the same. Um, which is an interesting little note. And then um, the first grammatical treatise where he is proposing how to write Old Norse more phonetically, um, he says, we ought to, as much as possible, follow the example of the English who speak the same language as us. This isn't about the mid 1100s. Right. Or who speak a language so close to ours that they are not very different. He's, it's, it's something very close to that. So there's a, a certain consciousness that early on or earlier on, the languages were quote unquote the same or nearly the same. Do you know if there's anywhere in English, older Middle English, where anything like that is said about Old Norse? 
I don't know of anywhere, but I haven't I haven't really looked. Um, most of my, I suppose, most of my intuition on that kind of thing comes from um, uh, I suppose kind of deductions from the way loans were passed into Old English. So in a, a video not that long ago, I commented that a lot of um, words in Northern English dialects and probably some in Southern English dialects as well uh, that are clearly taken from Old Norse. For example, don't, don't preserve inflectional endings, which implies, I think, that people were aware what was an inflectional ending and what wasn't mm -hmm. um, and things like that. So I, I, as far as I, the furthest I would go with that would be to say that I think people were probably aware enough of the structure um, that that kind of loaning um, took place where the word wasn't loaned as a whole, but it was loaned as the stem, which which they recognized as the stem. But I don't, I don't actually know if that accords with modern ideas about loaning so that that could be well off but but i'm not sure if it's ever referenced in in the literature there may be there may be references i don't know about you know what it occurred to me that just that that reminds me of is how in english you can make up fakey latin words or fakey yeah. spanish words by adding us for latin or o for spanish yeah. Yeah. right like people just you know like you could say my my computer us you know um carpe computer yeah. room or something like that like pe people are kind of yeah. vaguely aware of these endings um that could be something really similar between old english and old norse even if people don't always know exactly what the ending means they know it's an ending that's true so it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're aware of that there's any mutual intelligibility they just know i suppose if something occurs at the end of a word enough then you probably recognize it as an inflection yeah, I think that's actually potentially what's going on there. It doesn't necessarily have to be that they're speaking, but they see it or they encounter the language so much they're kind of aware that, oh yeah, all their words in an R. Yeah, that makes sense. The thing the thing you've said in the past about um, correspondences is, I think that that's kind of reinforced in my mind. So um, there was a thing uh, where the, the English speaker says Baras and the Norse speaker says Beidar. The Grata Baras and full of Pithare Brigge. Baras, Beirar, Pater Beirar. Tries to sort of get it, get it a cognate there. So I think that I think that's um, definitely a factor. There are obviously a few Old Norse words that that wouldn't necessarily be immediately intuitive. So um, something like I'm going to pronounce it wrong, but Eu for not, which I hmm. I suppose that must be related to Eki. In um, textbook Old Norse, what, that may be wrong there. Yeah, it's just something that I see in Old Danish so much that I thought I would just bring it into this. Okay. Uh, for for no, I think it is just a shorter form from that same thing from Eggy. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I'm not aware of that having an Old English cognate. So that, and and, and I think the standard old way, uh, the, the standard way of saying that in Old English would just be ne, affixing ne to the start mm. of the verb. So that might be. Um, that might take a minute to pick up, but I think it, it, I think it would probably be obvious from context um, after a little while. It might be confusing at first. Um, and then there are things like, sorry. No, I was just thinking about that. And, and it's interesting how nay as a negative is almost completely gone in Old Norse, except for sometimes in poetry. Does it happen in poetry? That, you do see it in poetry sometimes, but only pretty archaic poetry. Um, it's, you know, it's surprising. Old Norse just drops that old Germanic and old Indo-European nay, it's just gone. Are there cognates of it in, if, it, if you were disagreeing with a statement, would nay be the standard way of doing that? Or, or is that is that not the case either? Yeah, to say, to say no, that's nay. Okay. And in fact, I think, I think in the way that I spelled, when I, cause I did the uh, captions and the way that I spelled your nay in old English, I spelled it oh. as the old Norse word. Yeah, I noticed because that. I because I thought actually I was I was looking it up and it looked like the old the middle English maybe old English word nay actually is from the old Norse as a as an interjection. Yeah, yeah, I, I could imagine that. Yeah, because I'm not I'm trying to think whether so, I've seen it as an interjection. It's it's definitely used as an interjection in old English, but I don't know if that's later on. 
Um, but yeah, but, yeah but this would be late enough that. So actually, in a sense, it's kind of fun because we potentially already have one little borrowing. Yeah. Well, we discussed a little bit, didn't we? Um, <clears throat> or at least we we sort of touched on the possibility that maybe some some things have been borrowed already. So I think I say, um, "Nart" for "Are not? Are you not?" Um, and I think "Aron," which is the um, what I've taken to be a sort of northern Mercian, Northumbrian version of Auron, um, I think that's an old Norse borrowing. Uh, although I, may well, I don't know if it's a borrowing. I think it's actually just a cognate. Um, I because I, for one thing, I don't know how you would borrow it and get the in. Um, I've got boy, I've got some old English morphology books like ten feet away from me. I could look this up, but I, I actually think it's a cognate, not a borrowing. Okay, that makes sense. Um, Still, it would be an easy enough be. cognate to. To understand, you know, the our own area, it's not that hard to figure out. Yeah. Um, what, what else? I suppose pronouns like Han for he is 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 fairly sort of different from Old English he. Um, but but again, I think that kind of thing would come with context, wouldn't it? You know, there's a few places where Old Norse doesn't have a word anything like the Old English word. Like, there's no cognate anywhere close to it. Um, you know the the most noticeable as I'm looking at my notes here um, to me is is luck. So you asked me, is the day unlucky? It's the day unlucky. That, that luck word is completely foreign to Old Norse. It does come into the modern Scandinavian languages from German, but it's a West Germanic word. So you know the closest thing in Old Norse would be would oh oh happen unlucky. So that would be a word that you just have to learn. You just have to yeah. right. And there's a few places like that. We, we mentioned that maybe nay, the interjection might be a borrowing into Old Norse uh, from, uh, into Old English from Old Norse. There may actually be a case uh, that's invisible a little bit in our dialogue of the opposite, because when I was trying to figure out what your lines would be in, in Old Norse, doe, the, the doe, a female deer, um, yeah. was a little bit interesting to me because I noticed Danish does have that word but the other Scandinavian languages don't. So quite possibly, it's actually a borrowing into Danish from English, um, because otherwise you'd expect something from like Hind, which you have too in Old English, because Hind's call is, is calf. Yeah. yeah. Is Hind call uh, a natively occurring Old Norse word um, yep. as well? Good, good, yep, good. it's the same word. So Hind, yeah, it's it's literally like the doe calf, <laughs> right? Yeah. Doe's calf. Yeah, it's Hind, Hind or Culver in, in Old Norse, so the same thing, it'd be easy to figure out. You know, I think personally, they're a little bit less instantaneously mutually intelligible than I initially thought. I I would agree. I, I think. Um, sorry, were you gonna? Well, I was just gonna say, I. You know, you look at the stuff on paper. You think about all the cognates that you see, especially if you know both languages pretty well. You know, heck. I can read Beowulf, see an unfamiliar old English word, kind of think about it and, you know, guess what the old Norse word is and figure it out that way sometimes, right? Yeah. But that's that's sitting in, you know, the cool of the modern study. Yeah. And then there's all these places like Luck, um, maybe with dialects other than Danish, the the Doe word, where there's just going to be no way to guess what the word is in the other language if you don't know it. And so I'm kind of thinking now, my, my classic analogy to people has been, it would be like someone with an American accent, maybe a really thick regional American accent, trying to talk to someone with a, with a, a pretty broad Scots, where initially it sounds kind of unfamiliar, but you pretty quickly figure out what the substitutions are. Yeah. But I think it's actually a little bit wider than that now. I think it's maybe closer to Spanish Portuguese. Okay. Uh, I, I don't know if you where where you're at on this. I, I don't know the. I, I, I'm not. Don't intuitively know how how easy one is to understand for the other. I don't think. Well, in that case, there's a funny thing because it's actually easier for one side of that equation to understand the other, which I'm not okay. necessarily proposing. But I think there's just enough places where there's not a cognate, and I also noticed as we were going through this, 
the the verb conjugation is pretty different. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hang on, let me draw up your um, translation so I can follow along. If you comment on. Well, yeah. The, so the main thing is I was thinking about the singular of verbs, where in Old English, of course, you have the classic thing that you still see in the King James Bible, where you have the st second singular and the f third third singular. Whereas in Old Norse, both of those are are r, right? So uh, my Dane would say thu sukar han sukar, and you would say, you know, thu. What would that be? Seek would be like sechest. Yeah, those sechest, I would think. Yeah. To sechest, he sechest. Yeah, I think so. But in certain dialects of Old English, I think because sechon comes from a or sechon, I suppose, comes from a um, a word which I think in Proto-Germanic had all. So I think there's, I think that e arises from i umlaut. So um, in certain the further north you go, the later I umlaut forms tend to get unrounded. So it might have been something like surchon or even huh. surchon because because palatalized forms are slightly rarer in Northumbrian. So if you, if you went really far north, mm -hmm. you might actually hear something like ich surke or something like that, which is a lot more, probably a lot more bridgeable. Okay. That would cert yeah, that would certainly be an easy bridge to cross. But as you say, um, the, the, the uh, inflection would still be different. Although it occurs to me now, I mean, the English third singular S comes from something. Uh, I think you can actually see it sometimes. And I think it's actually originally a Northumbrian ending, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. And it's more widely applicable in Northumbrian as well. So you can have it in the second person as well. Um, in, well, in English anyway. I mean, that's not such a jump to go from, you know, S you know, sukkus sukkus to sukkur sukkur. That's not, yeah. that's not very formidable. So yeah, in, in Northumbrian, certainly you would expect that to be pretty easy. I've, I've also heard it said, um, if there's kind of an old argument that that S ending and the verb in English actually comes from Old Norse because the R ending in Old Norse is from Proto-Germanic Z, but that Z has turned R from runic evidence a few centuries before. So I don't think that it's actually responsible for the English ending. Yeah, it's so, you know, I think, I think our experiment has made me a little more cautious about claiming that these are so mutually intelligible. And I think the argument I would make is a little bit closer to, it would be very, very easy to learn the other. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think that was the, the impression I got from a video you did a while ago, um, where I, I think you actually said a similar thing, like they wouldn't be immediately intelligible, but they, they'd be easy for, for speakers of the other to learn. Because I think, as you say, I think there are probably situations where, um, well, I suppose it's, it's going back to the Spanish Portuguese example. There's, do you think that in that situation, it would just be a case of learning the substitutions and then maybe picking up a few words once you had those substitutions? Yeah, I think so. And I think also that they would be close enough that there would be cases of, you know, where it'd be pretty hard to get over your actual native language. Um, yeah. You know, where you'd be tempted because the words are similar enough, you'd be tempted to kind of like fall back into your English plurals or something. Because that's, that, like, that's a place where I think the substitutions are pretty easy. You know, English, English plurals in S are just blatantly equivalent to Norse plurals in R. Yeah, you know, yeah. so I think my Dane speaker really wouldn't struggle with the baras beirar thing because that's a perfect correspondence. Long a in old, old English is always the ei diphthong in Old Norse. The yeah. as plural is always the r plural in Old Norse. So it would just be you would figure that out real fast. Well, you, you mentioned the the do thing. Actually, that was something I I thought when I looked at your translation. I thought that seems like because I think it was like d dor or something. Yeah. In, in them. But it, it it struck me that that should be like dair or something like that from my limited knowledge of the correspondences. So that, yeah. that as you said earlier, that it might be a uh, a loan. Yeah, that's that's me just taking it as a loan. And 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 I I looked through um, the Danish Academy dictionary for 
and and they yeah they took it as an, a loan for molding the sh so i just treated it as that um the, now that is a place where you have a plural inflection in old english that you don't see in old norse that in plural you never you don't have any of those in plurals in old norse so that would be a little different but then actually old norse is a lot more consistent in a sense about plurals plurals are almost always are so if the old norse speaker kind of learns that oh yeah sometimes they've got this weird plural ending an in i'll just substitute an r and i can probably figure out what what's meant like I, I don't think that would be a huge jump maybe that would be one situation where it would be like you said there'd be there'd be an imbalance uh, mm -hmm. imbalance so maybe an old english speaker would have less trouble because the endings were so consistent in old norse than true the vice versa, maybe true because you could just learn basically well you know i throw an r at the end of this and i can make it plural you know, I might not get the vowel right, but but I'll get my meaning across. Especially as Danish is already kind of losing its uh, its it, the distinction between unstressed vowels. Um, yeah. Whereas the Old Norse speaker trying to speak Old English might have a lot more hesitation and uncertainty about plurals. This is actually an imbalance between German and English today, because German speakers figure out pretty fast; they can just add s to everything. Yeah, but that's English true. speakers, you know, we have to go, okay, like crap, this is or, or, uh, or is this just an umlaut thing? Or Yeah, it's it's actually, that is a, a good example, I think, for that imbalance. Yeah. And the German inflection morphology system is obviously cognate with the old, well, not, not perfectly cognate, but the same kind of system as the old English one. So I suppose maybe that's quite a good, a, a good analogy. Yeah. But I think, I, sorry. I, I think modern German and modern English are a much bigger gulf than Old Norse and Old English. I think so, yeah. yeah. But, you know, like, I'm, I'm trying to, th I was trying to think what the rough equivalent for modern English would be, which it's it's kind of unfair because, of course, more space has separated English from any other cognate language now, more space and time. Um, I mean, it's closer than modern English to modern Dutch. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is pretty easy. To figure out if you kind of get rolling on it, I, um, if it would be possible I still to... think Spanish. Sorry, I still think Spanish and Portuguese are a good example. Uh, Anders Torgerson mentions Plattdeutsch. Plattdeutsch, yeah, similar to Dutch, is pretty easy goal for an English speaker to jump. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder how it works with Dutch and German as well. I've seen some videos of people trying to understand between those two. That might but... be a good example too, and that also has that imbalance, because of course, German is so much more inflected than Dutch. Yeah, that's true. Grace asks, what do you think the mutual intelligibility would have been like during the reign of Alfred and the forming of the Dane law? So that would be perhaps 110, 20 years before this. But I think the main difference there is actually the dialects involved, because I think Alfred's West Saxon has a bigger jump to make to Old Norse so. than your Mercian Northumbrian. One of the big things that comes to my mind, besides the palatalization you already mentioned, he's saying chalf versus we're both saying call. Um, one of the big things that comes to my mind is um, the the R verb. So you say Aron, I say Eru, but Alfred's West Saxon says Sind, like German. Yeah. Yeah. Right, that's a pretty big jump that you're not gonna be able to just guess right away. Yeah. Um, so I think actually it's, it's, you know, you could never confirm this without a time machine. But my impression is that your Northumbrian Norse speaker, Northumbrian speaker and Norse speaker, after some initial uncertainty about some vowel equivalences and stuff like that, are going to get pretty close to 80% understanding of each other. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Which I just calculated with a supercomputer. That's exactly correct. Like, but, you know, roughly 80%. Yeah. Yeah. I think with West Saxon, with the some of those big differences of vocabulary and some of those big differences in phonology that might drop to more like 60. Yeah. I think that, that, that's one thing I think is that I, um, I couldn't have, um, it's hard to know in, in ordinary speech exactly what would have been the normal word for something. So there, there could be a situation where there's a, well, I mean like Baras and Bela, like there could be a situation where there's a word um, bar, which is the stand. I, I don't know if it would have been more common than elbor. That was just a, a sort of a, a thing for the for the experiment. But 
you have you have a word like bar, and then there's a less used word elbor, which is which is cognate with a word, but but you might not immediately work out that that's that's cognate because it's a word you don't use as much. So it might have been um, that I suppose it depends on the core vocabularies maybe and how much they would have aligned, rather than whether there was an existing cognate somewhere in the language. Um, yeah, because that existing cognate somewhere in the language, that also requires some thought. Um, yeah. And it's not always obvious right away. I actually encounter this teaching modern Scandinavian languages because, you know, when I was teaching old, not old, when I was teaching modern, I signed at, Ber at Berkeley, I would point out, you know, you're learning the verb to be, ek m. Okay, it's pretty easy to see. Or actually, modern Scandinavian is jeg er. But, but you are is thu ert. Which doesn't sound that familiar at first. Then you say, "Thou art." Oh, yeah. Right. But you have to think about it because you're not saying "thou art" all the time. Yeah. Or, or learning, um, say Norwegian or Swedish, um, uh, uh, look for the same verb I used actually in our conversation is "sukar," and that doesn't seem like anything that you would say in English. You know, look for. But then if you remember that it's "seek," yeah, it's not so. But you have to think about that stuff. It's it's not going to be right there on the tin. And I yeah. think, yeah, that would be a much bigger challenge with West Saxon than with uh, than with Anglian or, or Northumbrian. Yeah. Anglian well, dialects, I, anyway. I pointed out to one of my friends once that German dine, as in your, is cognate with thine in English. And that, that really surprised them. Because even, yeah. though, even though the, the vowels are kind of evolved convergently, and that's not, that's not like an ancient preservation of some vowel similarity, it's it's um yeah it's, it's the same word it's just not immediately intuitive yep especially because it's less used in one language than the other yeah which is exactly what we did with the boar words yeah I, i'm really curious if you can tell us a little bit more about the specific things you did with your old english here to adapt it to the spoken conditions of the east midlands in about 1000. okay um so I went for something that was somewhere between Mercian and Northumbrian was the aim because it's sort of it, it it is within Mercia I think the, the Nottingham setting but it's just shy of the Northumbrian dialect area so I thought it would be interesting to combine features um, and I actually possibly went a bit overboard on the Northumbrian in relation to the Mercian um, but um, that's not too egregious because they're they're both considered um, Anglian dialects. So they both share a lot of features, which doesn't necessarily imply that they're a continuation of um, whatever the Angles spoke on the continent before the migration period. But it's it's just it's just like a um, a scholarly term that refers to both of them because they share a lot of features. I, I got a lot of these from Folk's introductory grammar of Old English and also from extrapolations from um, modern dialects and things. So for example, the word bridge, which in, in textbook old English would be bridge. Um, I put it here as brug or brugge because it was in the dative, I think. Um, and that's based on, for one thing, it's based on the fact that we see palatalization happening a bit less in Northumbrian Old English than it does in other dialects. Um, mm. And for another thing, there is a, a modern dialect word, brig, which I suppose might come from Old Norse, but it, it occurs in a lot of place names and it, 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 it means bridge. So I interpreted that as probably native because we see this um, palatalization not occurring in certain situations. And the same occurs to words like rig, meaning ridge, uh, and stuff like that. Um, and that lack of palatalization, uh, I also applied to the word each in textbook Old English, which means I. So um, in, uh, in the Anglian dialect, you have sometimes you have a um lenition of k at the end of a word when it occurs in in a low sort of low stress location so something like uck which i think i put in the translation which i sent over to you with the word uck meaning but um often is spelled a h which suggests it's pronounced something like ach mm -hmm. um and in northumbrian that occurs more widely in situations where you would expect the k to be palatalized. So one example of that is itch, where uh, a Proto-Germanic word or a West Germanic word, something like ik, 
that they come each through palatalization. Um, <clears throat> and in this situation, because it retains that k, this is then lenited to sh, so ich. Well, that, well, it's written in text as ih, which, which is interpreted as pronounced something like ich, but mm. I'm not sure. Um, but that's what I've gone with here. And you see um, evidence of that um, unpalatalized k in ich, even in the Middle English period, where you have Chaucer's Reeves tale, which uses deliberately northern forms when it's, it's describing a northern setting. Um, and one of those is that it says ich instead of ich for I. Um, so that was that was one example of a thing which was possibly a bit too Northumbrian. Um, so while that lenition definitely happened in Mercian, I'm not sure if the lack of palatalization would have occurred that far south, but, but, but that, that was a tentative one. Um, as for uh, a lot of the vowels, a lot, a lot of the diphthongs aren't there where they would be in textbook Old English, so they're smooth to monophthongs. And that's, uh, that's a result of a couple of things. So, so for one, you have this thing called Anglian smoothing, where all of the diphthongs can be smooth to monophthongs in certain situations before um, certain specific consonants. Um, but also you have a situation where certain sounds never diphthongized in the first place because uh, they weren't in a um, because a sound change happened early on that meant that they weren't in a position to diphthongize. So an example of that is kalf here, which would be chalf in textbook Old English. So in textbook Old English, you have a breaking of a to a, and then um, because there's an a, that means that the k at the start of the word palatalizes to ch. So where you'd have chalf, you have kalf because that a has retracted to R. So a lot of the vowel differences can be can be put down to those those kinds of things, um, and that's also why I've had I, I've, I've put nard instead of nard um, with the with the back vowel instead of the front with instead of the diphthong. Um, <clears throat> I think I think that might be it. One thing is that I haven't included eu because that's something that tends to occur in West Saxon. Um, mm. It's, it's normally, I think it's, it, as far as I know, it's always the I mutation of something. And those things I mutated to different things in um, in uh, <clears throat> in non-West Saxon dialects. So there's no EU. I thought about putting EU in, which is a, a proto-Germanic sound that got preserved in um, uh, Northumbrian for quite a long time and Mercian for a certain amount of time, but not quite as long. So I think that would have affected the word hail day, which it, which mm. means today. So it would have been something like heel day, but um, because because of the Mercian setting, I thought um, that would probably have already merged with ale by this point. So maybe in Northumbria you still have eel at this point, but I think even by the even in Northumbria by that point it was probably starting to merge with ale. Um, and, and speaking of Hildai, um, just to preempt corrections, I wasn't sure which case to go with for Hildai. Um, so I, I, I went with, um, I sort of did it by analogy with Sunnerus uh, Dai, which I put in the accusative, because that's that's how I've seen it used in um, Bosworth Toller examples and stuff like that when it follows the preposition on. So I thought maybe on today works, but, but, but if that's right, if there's textual evidence against that, then then by all means, that's that's my mistake. And I'm sorry for tarnishing the video with it. <laughs> but No, I would support that being accusative because it's accusative in Old Norse. And after all, you might be losing your noun endings at this point, like that's just true. a little bit. So um, actually, so what you mentioned about palatalization makes your Old English more intelligible to my Old Norse speaker that's because chael is a lot further from Old Norse kolv than kolv is, right? Yeah. So that's, yeah. and, and actually it occurs to me too, that that might be another place where an Old English speaker has a tiny advantage over the Old Norse speaker. Because if you're a Southern Old English speaker, you might've heard Northern Old English here, there and yon, yeah. right? So you might say chill, but you've heard some Northerner say kolv. So when a Norseman says kolv, you're already a little bit more ready for what that might mean oh yeah they don't that that sounds like the northern word yeah something like yeah, that that's a good point and it, it might be 
Sorry. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to say we, we discussed in the crowdcast um, that we did uh, a week or two ago as well the, the possibility that K and Ch were still possibly allophones of the same phoneme for quite a while in Old English because they're, they're alliterated with each other, which doesn't necessarily mean they're allophones of the same phoneme. But um, there was probably some recognition that Ch was in some way related to K. Um, yeah. By old English speakers, so they might they might just intuitively have recognised k before a front vowel as equivalent of ch, but, but that, that's, right. that's speculative, I suppose. Right, which would be an advantage to the old English speaker speaking to the Norseman, who who knows what ch sounds like to a Norseman. I'm I'm not quite yeah. sure what that would even sound like. Um, so I I see two questions over here from Mason Stitch. Uh, let me make uh, and now from Grace. Let me make some comments just just parallel to what you said about uh, your your sort of localization. Because I, of course, didn't use uh, completely standard classical uh, old Icelandic from the 1200s. I was trying to make the Danish in the 1000s. So I read a lot of old Danish in preparation for this. I was looking at some of the earliest leech books preserved in Danish. Some of those come from close to 1300, which is pretty early for Danish. I looked at runic inscriptions found in England. And I also took a look at just... <laughs> You know, anything from the first couple centuries of the Danish manuscript tradition, just to kind of see what direction Danish was going in. So taking that and then also considering some of the more archaic features you'd expect to still be there, I constructed my Viking Age Old Danish. So some of the archaic stuff I've still got is, is he still saying S and presumably Vas or Was for is and was, not Er, Var, because those haven't been analogized to the R that's in the plural yet. I've never seen those R's that early anywhere in Scandinavia, so I think this guy would probably still say S and Vos, which would still, which would, by the way, also be more intelligible to the English speaker than classical Old Norse Er and Var. S and Vos sounds a lot like English Is and Vos. Um, I still have him saying W instead of V, but I spelled it V. I tried to keep my spellings as recognizable as I could for people that might know classical Old Norse but I pronounce the V's as W's. I actually just released a video about this today. Uh, I think the W, it just like it, like 37 minutes ago, the, the W to V change seems to happen at different times in different parts of Scandinavia. I think it happened later in East Norse. So I just went ahead and said W. That's also something that makes the English and Norse closer than classical Old Norse would be to classical Old English. For instance, I said weather, which sounds exactly like the English word weather. Got weather. The pronouns are a little bit different. So uh, one of the really distinct things about West Scandinavian versus East Scandinavian, West Scandinavian, which of course includes Old Icelandic, says ek for I. Old East Scandinavian says yak. Uh, it's broken, but it's not broken in the West. So of course I did that. Um, and then you don't have lowering of long I-R to long E-R. So the date of me is mir. Uh, nominative you all plural or you polite is ear instead of instead of mare air. Um, and I had his um, singular verb inflection a little bit more collapsed. So you see that really, really early in East Scandinavian where the second, third singular ending R spreads to the first singular. I'm just letting that already happen. So he says yaksukar, not yaksuke or something like that. And I have his vowels kind of collapsing in unstressed position. Yeah. When he's speaking carefully, you can hear the distinct vowels in the endings. So when he's considering baras, berar, like really thinking and saying it slowly, you can hear that distinct ah. But at the very beginning of the dialogue, when we're just saying good morning, I just have schwa's there, go then morgan. Because it looks like Danish is moving really, really early toward uh, just merging all those unstressed vowels of schwa. Um, because already in like the late 1000s in Danish inscriptions, I'm seeing confusion between the sensuous vowels. So I'm assuming that's already kind of kind of going on. Um, but anyway, all of that actually, all those things really kind of make it more like Old English, right? Yeah. Um, both the archaisms like S and Was and the, uh, the innovations like kind of simplifying the verb system. It, it gets it a little bit closer to something an English speaker could understand than what you're going to see if you pick up, you know, Gordon's introduction to Old Norse, which is Old Icelandic 250 years later. 
I wonder whether I should have reduced the vowels a bit more for that for that period because I know generally um, historically northern middle English dialects have had a lot of vowel reduction which later ends up happening in the south but um, I think I naturally I have to I have to push myself not to use unstressed vowels in certain positions so maybe maybe that worked to my benefit another thing I forgot to mention which might also have increased intelligibility is that in um, in a lot of Northumbrian texts you see the a n ending of um, certain verbs in the infinitive um, getting reduced to just ah and I think that occurs in words in certain verbs in Old Norse like leka and, and things like that as well. I'm that's that's say. always the infinitive in Old Norse. It's always ah, just yeah. So that would actually be exactly equivalent then. So then you would be saying, you know, driva, and I would be saying driva. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So that, that, would... that would hopefully make things a lot more. I wonder. I, I wonder if there was any nasalization in Old English before the loss. But I, I, oh. I feel like. If there was still natalization at the time, then it probably would still be pronounced. It would probably still be spelled vowel n in text. But I could be wrong. Yeah. I forgot to mention that too. Is I I sort of tried to nasalize. So um, in the 1140s, the first grammarian in Iceland says there's a distinct class of long nasal vowels, and you definitely see evidence for that being distinct in runic inscriptions because nasal a is written with a different rune than oral long a long. Nasal long A is different from oral long A. Um, Icelandic seems to preserve that longer than other dialects, but this is still so early that I thought it, there were probably still at least traces of it. So I sort of compromised where, again, kind of like with my unstressed vowels, where he's speaking more distinctly, I tried to kind of nasalize, right? Aren't you Aldun Fran? Yeah. Right? Or you're the one from Derby, Fran, Derby. Harald Fra Derabir Erinir A. But then when it just says E Dog, I don't have I don't you know, today I don't since that's so unstressed to say E Dog, not E Dog. Yeah. Like so I'm kind of thinking of this as being again a little bit of a transitional period. The uh personal pronouns like Han, he, Hana, her, uh also you'd expect to have the nasal vowel at this point. So I subtly tried to do that and say Han, Hana, but not quite I don't know. It's 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 probably not very audible, but I'm trying to kind of faintly do it. I don't, I don't like, know. I don't know how like, good at modern English speakers are at differentiating between them anyway. Although maybe I'm uh, terrible at it. I'm, I'm not very really good at it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, after a, so it might not matter so much. I'm slightly better now after having spent a a, a pretty intensive week in Montreal. Um, <laughs> but that's <laughs> but I'm still not great at it. Yeah, um, I, so we got a couple questions over here. Let me see what we've got. So Mace asks, uh, if you guys were to do this again, is there any places you feel you could either invent slang or informal speech or contractions you feel would make logical sense to apply in a spoken sense? Well, you did this, Simon. You, you had some some contractions. Hang on. Let me check the. Let me refer back to the. Um, and I had one. Oh, uh, do you mean in terms of like nart? for near yeah. art. Yeah, well that, that that kind of thing is attested in old um in old English text. So the the um the word near is often just reduced to na and then that's shoved at the start of a um a verb or in some in some cases actually replaces the first um letter of a verb. So uh will one and nil one for want and not want and things like that. And do you mean, I think you, yeah yeah absolutely um you did thoughts, didn't you? Yep. For Which that. is also attested. Yeah. So there's, yeah, yeah there's the good attestation of some of some um, I suppose what have become formalized um, contractions. Yeah, and then as far as slang, it's sort of hard. Like, actually, I'm sort of reminded of a video I did about cussing in about August, where mm -hmm. you know what's cussing in one language is it's pretty hard to sort of anticipate what cussing is in another language because different things are taboo. Slang is the same way. It's hard to anticipate what's slang in one language from what's slang in yours because, you know, what sounds really informal in one language is actually formal in the other. A good example of this is, you know, in English, how's it going is a pretty informal way of greeting someone. Whereas in, you know, Norwegian Bukmal Vorengorda, 
which means the exact same thing is actually like a formal polite how are you doing so sure. you know I, I don't really know how to anticipate slang but i will say that one thing that we did consciously try to do was make this conversation both casual like it it doesn't like we're not trying to be really stilted with each other but also not such a predictable situation as most of these the example conversations you see in like a textbook learning you know how to speak french in 50 days or something yeah. all those conversations are so stilted and predictable i wanted to have a situation that's not like one of those phrase book conversations but yeah. also so isn't like what was coming next sort of thing. right and and it's also not like something really stereotype with vikings and englishmen like i just got off the boat and i'm going to burn your house down like, i want yeah. to burn your house and you say please do not burn my house or something <laughs> like i just thought yeah, please do not burn my house just looking at the phrase book <laughs> Yeah, right. Like, well, please, please is difficult. Please refrain from burning my house. Please refrain. I do not wish you to burn my house. It, you know, so I think actually, although we're not going to get to slang, I think that we got a conversation that's informal, which is yeah. actually, it was tough. Like, this was one of the hardest, in terms of videos that I've made, as short as this was, it, it's it's hard. Yeah, I, I, I'm still expecting somebody to pick out some mistake that I've not noticed in which case that's not an indictment on jackson that's, that's very much my my errors I, i've been known to make mistakes in the past with syntax and stuff but oh, there will we always sorry. be indictments yeah, yeah. One, one thing we tried to do with the formalities is the old english um in uh at least in text as far as i'm aware doesn't have a tv distinction but i think old norse does um so we I started off using thul, and you started off using ir. I think that was the pronoun, wasn't it? Um, and then at one point, I say you can use thul. Right. Um, indicating possibly an understanding of the um, formality conventions of the other language, maybe. I was curious about that because I, I wondered if if you saw that in Old English that early. You do see it on Old Norse that early because skaldic poetry from the pre-Christian period has uh, the polite plural you and, and also the royal we. Really? I didn't know if that was in Old English that early. I, but I, it, I don't think it was, but maybe okay. it might, might have appeared in text, uh, in, in speech before in text. But Okay, so so that's actually the thing I didn't know. Y you aren't saying that because your language at that convention, you were saying that because you were aware my language did, which that, is pretty cool. And intention. I think that's actually... It it worked. That's potentially realistic. I mean, I've definitely had, um, I've definitely had professors that would have made me call them Z if they could have. Um, <laughs> you know, is that something you wouldn't be conducive to? Yeah, it's it's something that yeah. If you do understand the convention, that you would understand that I'm trying to be polite. Yeah, that's that's cool. Um, so that's actually that's another little informality formality thing. Uh, Stitch over here asks, did you encounter any words that led to the wrong interpretation because of their similarities? Take, for example, Dutch-German comparison. Someone who speaks Dutch might think the German word das Meer means lake because the Dutch word for lake is Meer. In German, however, das Meer means the sea. An interesting thing I noticed was uh, you said when you were saying, um, I wish I'd seen the deer, you used a word like Usker. Uskar yeah. or something like that. Uskar which um, I don't know if that's is that cognate with um, wish with Wishon? Because I know I know it must be it used to have sk in it, which which then became and it used to have the n, which which I assume disappeared because of the spiral. The spiral yeah, it, it must be cognate with Old English Wishon because um, what you've got there is just an Old Norse. The W or later V is dropping before a rounded vowel. Yeah, that makes sense. And then the nasal is lost in Old English before a fricative. Um, but well, I was thinking um, Old Norse well. too. Really? Oh. Yeah, because it's not Wunsch, it's oh, not like true. Oh, sorry, yeah. I, I've just seen... I, I had it in my head that there was an N in there, but I don't know. I was wrong, yeah. Um, yeah, but I, I was thinking that, that might be interpreted by an Old English speaker as um, cognate with Arskion instead of Wishon. So it might be, hmm. they might have heard it as something like, um, 
I'm I'm asking myself that, whereas in fact right. it means something that I wish that for myself, sort of thing. Well, uh, but even contextually, you could maybe figure that out because it sounds like to the English speaker maybe something like I asked that for me, like I'm asking, you know, yeah. the powers that be. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's yeah. a funny possibility. There'd be just that minor confusion of of what you're hearing. Yeah, I suppose it's like a maybe that counts as a false friend kind of situation. Um, but of course, we don't. We can't know how they would have interpreted that. But um, yeah, like you say, it might it might be one of those things that became became obvious from context very quickly. I think you also have to wonder if um, if speakers of these two languages would notice the way that those Ws drop before rounded vowels. So mm. if they could anticipate after enough contact with the other language that you would have something like, you know, Old English ward, Old Norse orth. Yeah. And if that would even lead in situations like, like this to sort of like false insertions of a W if you were an Old Norse speaker yeah, trying to speak probably. Old English. Right. That, that would be yeah. a possibility that we didn't consider because we're not trying to speak each other's languages. We're trying to communicate in our own. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wonder whether there would have been widespread kind of attempts to accommodate for the other language in actual everyday speech, whether people would try, deliberately try to sort of, uh, you know, settle on a middle ground by by deliberately pulling in things like that, like the W sound at the start of certain words and overcompensating. Um, another possible one is when you say that the bore uh, not the boar, the, the dough that you saw is probably already roasted on the, the Lord's spit. Mm. Uh, the word you use for Lord, Freya, uh, that's yeah. the name of a god in Old Norse, right? That's Freya. Oh, right? yeah. So it is occasionally used in English, I mean, excuse me, in Old Norse for a, uh, for a, a human lord, but it's mm you know, most of the occurrences of that word are referring to the name of the God whose name just means the Lord. Yeah, so I think, that. I think, I think the Norse speaker is going to understand that fine, but like, there's a quick moment where he's thinking like, the, like, does the God hunt in this forest or something? Like, I, I don't know, but, but I think that he could figure it out pretty fast and it wouldn't actually cause confusion, but it would be a funny place where there'd just be that one little, little stumble. Yule asks, in many countries, we have greetings like ahoy, or hey, or oh, hey, from a maritime context, but today used in everyday language. What do we know about Old English and Old Norse welcome terms? So same question for the short form of good morning. On the north coast of Germany, it's moin, and in two northeastern provinces of the Netherlands, moi, both completely unusual, and the rest of both countries. I mean, you could imagine there would be shortenings like that in, in conversational Old Norse, Old English too. Actually, Morn is a really good example because, mm. you know, the, the the Germanic root, I think in Gothic, and I'm 10 feet away from the book that would confirm this, but I'm, I'm pretty sure in Gothic, it's like Morgans. And so in the, the in the oldest stages of English and German and Scandinavian, you see something like Morgun. Yeah. But many of these languages independent, independently develop a conversational shortening of that that's something pretty close to Morn, a Mon, or something yeah. like that. Well, I, I think in English, Morian um, became Morn, possibly. Oh, no, actually, it would become Morrow. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, carry carry on. I, I need to think more about that. No, uh, but I'm just thinking, like, so it's conceivable that in Old English or Old Norse, you know, speaking more casually, you might say, you know, go the Morn, right? Yeah. Just allied the G and that second vowel together, which is something that's happened in the later stages of all these languages. Yeah. Again, it's sort of hard to predict where that's happening because our written records tend to be pretty formal. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're, they're often not going to use those casual forms like that, but it's very, very plausible that those casual forms existed. Yeah. Yeah. Another thing is I, I always wonder how, um, things like pronoun reduction, cause in, um, in modern English, well, in, in standard modern English um, and in modern English dialects, you have various levels of pronoun reduction where the vowels of a pronoun might get replaced with schwa. So you mm -hmm. have the instead of you. In dialects that have, have thou until late on, you have the instead of thou. Um, and, and in some places, you'll still hear the instead of they in certain positions of low stress. But 
in theory, um, Old English isn't really supposed to have had schwa. I suppose it, it uh, until later on. So I suppose it could have had it allophonically, but I wonder if it would have had weakened forms like that, or if Old Norse would have had weakened forms like that in, in casual, rapid speech. I mean, it's plausible. You see it in um, in the modern Scandinavian languages where you often have na from hana, her. Uh, okay. That's That sort of thing is pretty frequent. Um, of course, the prime English example is um. um yeah, yeah. yeah, I'm sure they're probably were reduced if not if the vowel wasn't reduced you'd still expect yeah something like na wouldn't be unexpected in an old old norse poetry you see uh ek i often reduced to just k okay. on on a verb right so ampk for i am instead of ek am actually but that, of, sorry that, that only seems to be in poetry that i've ever seen i think um you have later examples so from around the, I'll find a source before I actually do the video, put the video up. But um, I think from around the 17th century, you have some dialects which which still retain itch um, as a pronoun, and they tend to uh, reduce it to ch in certain situations. So if they're saying I will, itch will, then it, it often becomes chill or something like that. So I could imagine the same thing. I, I think I've actually. Um, No, that's but, really cool. But yeah, so that's, you that's may cool. Have the same thing, although I don't know of any text from early on, but it's very, it's very cool that the number of contractions you get from Old Norse texts. That's very nice. Yeah, well, they're always trying to save syllables in poetry. That's so that's that's about an hour. Uh, we got some good questions. I think we covered a lot of the ground of what we did here. That was a lot of work on my end. I think it was a lot of work on your end too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah any any last thoughts you want to you want to leave with this about about this little project? Um, let me check that I've not missed anything off my list of things I was going to um, mention. Um, I think that's everything. But th thank you very much indeed because you did the bulk of the work here. You suggested it and you you came up with the the, the bulk of the script. So thank you very much indeed for this this project is very 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 fun well you came up with the cool parts of the script <laughs> and you're think... and you're a better actor <laughs> so... I, don't, I, don't, I don't think that, i don't think that's actually true but thank you very much indeed. well we'll see who hollywood calls after this all right well Please. well patreon thank you so much for coming here for this conversation about this and um i've enjoyed talking about you know this is actually this was more fun for me than a lot of videos are in as much as I know that 20 years ago, I would have loved coming across this. Yeah, so would I. Well, more recently, but yeah, before I before I was into linguistics, I would I would have loved it. Yeah, yeah this would have been awesome to me then. So it's kind of cool to make something that I know I would have really liked before I was on the other side of this yeah. and the one making it. All right. Well, thank you, Simon, so much, and uh, thank you, Patreon, and for now. Gott weather or Trigwar Orer. Indeed. <laughs> I can't remember where I'm I said. I think I just said gold weather, didn't I? I think you just said yeah, good weather. Yeah. <laughs> all right. All the best, everybody.